we are on chapter 10 and and I really had a comment on this chapter because um, chapter 10 is all about long-term liabilities um, as you know we finance uh, the country with bonds what's called a bond what the hell is a bond a bond is a loan um, and we're going to get into that today and I'm going to go through the powerpoints with you um, obviously, I opened up uh, with with what's going on in the Dow Jones as we speak. If I could take my little camera off the top of the screen here behind me, um, you'll see me turning around. I have a large screen TV that has uh, the stock market. It, uh, the CNBC is live behind me. Uh, the market's up 575. Do I care? Um, it's interesting to me if you haven't been following what I've been writing on on LinkedIn or or even uh, in <coughs> in our stream do so you know because I probably have some ideas that you've never heard before um, if you've come up sort of through K through 12 or uh, if you're an older student um, and all you've heard is Keynesian economics, uh, you haven't run into someone who has my ideas. So uh, in the interest of heterodoxy, uh, in other words, both sides of an argument, um, I, I present that argument, uh, the Austrian argument, and I think I present it pretty well. I've been studying it, oh God, for a long, long time, 40 years now, something like that. So anyhow, um, off to the races. I want to get through these pretty quickly so that so that you can uh, um, start the homework. And I can throw up another. Um, uh, I may throw up another tape of going over the homework so that you can catch up on that. But here we are, accounting for long-term liabilities, Chapter Ten. Uh, you did short-term liabilities last time and I put up other people's lectures on those I didn't have my handy uh, what do you call this studio set up so I finally got my act together and did that I'm on zoom too which is because I'm a recovered alcoholic so I get to go on zoom and do that crap too uh, I've been speaking at meetings in places like California, which is kind of exciting. Uh, but anyhow, chapter 10, what are we doing? Types of notes, prepare entries, uh, compound bond financing and stock financing, right? When, that's the first thing we did in this class was talk about uh, the first entry we made in assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Put that at the top of your page if you're taking notes. Um, the first thing we did was Jim started a business. How did he start the business? Well, he started the business by issuing common stock, uh, and that would be over in the owner's equity side of the equation, and um, an asset, which would be cash, so $30,000 in cash, and thirty thousand dollars of common stock issued well now we're going to go over how that looks in the real world and and how um no, that not that you know the opening day was the real world but that, that that how it might look uh in uh what i look at on cnbc every day so um we're going to prepare these entries record bond issuance and interest expenses and talk about bond pricing, which if you can understand bond pricing, you will begin to understand why I rant and rave about government debt. Uh, and that's that's one of the reasons that I love to give this lecture. Uh, it, it opens people's eyes to the world of, of government debt and what's going on. Uh, when, when and, <laughs> and here we are with uh, President Trump, who, who presented himself as some sort of conservative, and as you know, I'm a libertarian, so I don't have a dog in that fight, but um, he's looking an awful lot like Hillary Clinton these days, or Bernie Sanders, um, because what's the, the reaction to uh, this virus has been a pure socialist reaction, in my opinion, uh, and I'll tell you why as we go through this lecture. So anyway, bond financing, 
is, is one way to finance a business, borrowing money, right? Who, my, w w sitting here in this house, this house was financed with bonds. Um, it was financed with cash, but uh, the, the portfolio that I live off of is a bond portfolio that my dad built over his career. And uh, I sort of curate in a way. I, I, I'm part of the team that, that uh, does the management of that bond portfolio uh, along with Morgan Stanley. Well, what do we do? We buy municipal bonds. In other words, my father and somewhat mine and my sister's uh, work lives have gone into this big pool and we loan that money out. Our savings is loaned out to companies to finance their businesses. In our case, particularly municipalities to finance municipal projects. So we, we, my family, loans money to towns like Glenwood Springs to do maybe a water project or uh, build a hospital or you name it. And when I look over uh, our municipal bond portfolio, a portfolio, just like an art portfolio, um, we have a portfolio of bonds and we loan money to all different municipalities around the country. Uh, some in Miami, some in New York, some in Illinois. Uh, these are all different what we call municipal bonds. Um, bond is a loan. That's what you have to get through your, say, your head. A bond is a loan. Um, bond financing transactions during the bond life. A corporation um, would pay bond interest payments to investors. So a corporation like Microsoft or, or uh, um uh, Apple would issue bonds in order to expand or come out with a new product or build a factory, you know, expansion, that kind of thing. Uh, they, they would issue bonds. They would issue debt. So, and then these bonds would have interest payments and the interest payments go to the investor, right? So I, I uh, loan money to a municipality and they pay me interest. Interest, of course, the time value of money, right? It, it's the price of money in, in the vernacular of, of the Austrian economist. Uh, money has a price, and that is the interest that you get paid for your money. Um, that's why I'm so vehemently against the Federal Reserve. Uh, for, they set the price of money, and that's not a good idea. I, I, I think that has really bad uh, ramifications in the long run. So, uh, projects that need a lot of money are often financed with bonds. You can see I put these down here so you could see them. An issue is written promise to pay the par value. There's, there's the, you know, the $20 phrase right there, par value of the bond with interest. Par value is also called the face value. is paid at a specific future date called the maturity date. There's your vocabulary. Most bonds also require the issue to make semi-annual interest payments. It's usually um, July and December. The amount of interest paid each period is determined by the multiplying the par value by the bond's contract rate of interest during that period. So um, here it is in, in uh, the form of a equation. Interest payment equals bond par value times contract interest rate times time. Mm. Um, I'm not drinking vodka. It's um, juice. Okay, so next, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of bond financing rather than, say, issuing common stock? Um, bonds have the advantages that they don't affect owner control. If, if you issue bonds, you're borrowing money. You're not giving the borrower or the, or the lender the ability to sit on the board or, you know, hire and fire people or do do anything uh, that an owner of the company could do. Um, interest on the bonds tax deductible. That's fantastic. Um, I Again, I, our family, we invest in municipal bonds and, and those are not taxable. So we don't care about the deduction. Um, bonds can increase 
uh, your return on equity. Yes, right? You're, you're getting more return because you have less equity owners, so you're getting a higher return on your equ equity. Excuse me. A disadvantage is that, is that bonds require payment of both periodic interest and par value at maturity. So if you issue a 20-year bond, 20 years from now, you got to pay the amount of the bond. If it's a $100,000 bond or a $10,000 bond, you owe the ten grand. Plus, you've made all these interest payments along the way, and, and we'll illustrate that. Um, bonds can also decrease return on equity. They can work the other way. Uh, so here, here's the main advantages, and, and the disadvantages are below them. Let me, let me scroll up here so you can see them. Uh, and, and maybe uh, if that's your gig, you can look those over on your own time. Here's a bond. This looks like a, a for the football team, the, the Minnesota Vikings. If they, maybe they borrowed money in order to build a stadium or some crap like that. But you used to get bond certificates. You'd get these certificates uh, and hold on to them. And, and you know put them in a file somewhere and they gave they were called bearer bonds and you could give them to your your kids or on their birthday or you know or uh, after you die in an estate and they would get the coupons on those bonds on those loans however many were left bond issuance states the number of bonds authorized their par value contract interest rate it has those components on it um, there's also this thing called an indenture, and, and the indenture is like a prospectus. It's, it's sort of the uh, booklet or the description of, of what the bond is and what it will do and what the bond is for. You know, you, you want it as, a, as an investor, you want to know are the, are, what's, what's going on here. Is, is the Minnesota Vikings going to build a stadium? Is that going to create revenue? Is that something I think we ought to do? Well, if it's not, nobody's going to buy your bonds. Nobody's going to lend you the money to do that. So you, you it starts out with a good idea. Now, uh, bond trading and bond trading bonds are securities that can be purchased or sold in the securities markets. They get a market value. It's expressed as a percent of their par value. The closing price indicates that IBM stock. Uh, this should say bond. This is a misprint. Damn it. Watch, I'll put it in there. Bond <laughs> is being sold at 103.08 of face value. So 3.08% more than it's worth on its face. The I, uh, IBM bond quote here is interpreted left to right as bonds issuer, rate, maturity, 10, 2042. That's a long time. Principles pay the yield. 3.81% of bond at the current price. The volume, daily dollar worth of trades, you know, the volume in, in, in the stock market behind me, it, it'll tell you how many shares are changing hands every day. How many, how many of these bonds are changing hands every day? That's the volume of, of bonds, um, just like any other type of volume of sales. So how do we, how do we uh, record these the issuance and interest expense. Well, uh, December 31st, um, a company issued the following bonds, par value of 100000 That's pretty uh, standard. The stated interest rate, 8%. Unheard of anymore. Nobody, nobody. It, it, these are like junk, junk, junk bonds. Um, 630, 1231, these are the payment dates. I said July, I meant June 30th uh, and, and December 31st. Maturity date uh, in two years. So it's a two year bond at 8%. Um, you know, not, there's no, not many bonds like this out there, but uh, there's a few. So what happens? Here, here's our entry bonds payable. We owe, we owe, if, if we're taking in the cash that someone loaned us this is the the obviously the um, issuer side of the bond you know the company that needs to borrow money in order to do something right in order to build something they need cash right so they get a hundred thousand dollars in cash from you or me the the lender and they have this thing called a payable 
a bond payable. Well, that doesn't. Th this reflects the whole bond, right? The hundred thousand dollars that you loaned out. Um, that that that's that the the issuer borrowed or or the uh, investor loaned. That this this indicates that hundred thousand does not indicate the interest or the price of that money. So there it is, hundred thousand eight percent two years, um, and we're going to pay interest. Let's see how that works. Right, that's next. The interest. Let me see. Now, here's how we make the payments. On June 30th, the issuer of the bond pays the first semi-annual interest payment of $4,000. So we have a $100,000 bond, 8%. 8% of, of 100,000 would be 8,000. So for a half year, it's going to be 4,000. The entry is made every six months until the bonds mature. So there's going to be, what, four payments? Yeah, four interest payments. Uh, the, the issuer pays and records its semi-annual obligation every six months until the bonds mature, right? And it's got a little note down here in the journal, right? 8% uh, times 100,000 times, you know, whatever, half year. So now, now uh, here on the maturity date, on December 31st, 2021, the bonds mature and the issuer of the bond pays the face value. You got to pay them back to the bondholder. So December 31st, the, our, our journal entry looks like this. We have a bond payable, right, that we're going to uh, debit, right, to, to reduce. And this cash, we're going to credit to reduce, right? We got rid of our payable and got rid of our cash. Right. So we had to pay that. So why, when you issue a bond, you know, the idea is, thank, thanks to uh, Pacioli, you start putting that money aside in order to pay that bond off in the future. You don't sit around and go, eh, well, you know, I, this is the problem in government. Government doesn't pay off its debt anymore. It used to. Uh, we don't pay off the debt. We simply refinance it. So this, this, when it comes to the U.S. government and, and, and paying off debt, they don't. They issue more bonds to pay off these bonds. Okay? Now, this is an, quite a concept to get through your head. But just imagine, uh, I call it a Ponzi scheme, but they're, they're issuing new money to pay off old money all the time and this just goes on and on odd infinitum so uh and, and we're about to do it to the tune of another three trillion dollars or so in deficit spending in, in there's no revenue all of this money that's going out there's there's no revenue to back it up it's just simply money printing all right now we, we've got this concept of discount or premium now, this is, I shouldn't chew ice while I'm talking on this damn thing. Um, you've got to get this through your head. This is the, the basic understanding of bond discounts and premium. Also goes to your basic understanding of the interest rate as the price of money and the time value of money. Basic concepts in business vernacular in in the language of business if you understand these things i promise you you will be amongst maybe one percent of the country that understands this the, the the relationship between a discount or premium of a bond and the selling price if you can get this if you can get this relationship and and fool around with it enough so that you you get pretty good at it you'll understand how the world works in a in in a uh, a very real way. You'll understand how um, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Isn't that weird? That's an old old saying, and it and it connotes or indicates time value of money. Uh, and and if you think about it for for more than ten minutes, if you sit and think about the time value of money, you you can understand that when the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, P 
people don't save. And that's bad. They just consume. And that's why we're in the situation we're in. It's not because the, the coronavirus is a pin. It's a pin that pricked a bubble. It's not, it, it's sort of like if I'm kicking the cat, it's not the cat. This virus is an awful thing and, and, and a medical situation that should be solved by not politicians. Thank you. But uh, it's not what was wrong with the economy in the first place. What was wrong in the economy is too much borrowing, too much of these bonds out there. So let's talk about how premiums and discounts are determined. Okay. So what, what happens is the bond, the bond issuer has a contract rate. This is in the indenture, as I said before. Um, it's, it's the basic, you can go back a few slides and, and look, uh, you, you can see just what, you know, what's on that piece of paper. Well, the market then ha sets the interest rate. Now, just a few weeks ago, when this whole, the, the crap started to hit the fan, the Federal Reserve came out and they set interest rates at zero. So I've got a whole bunch of bonds. I, I say I, my family, my dad, and, and I, we have a whole bunch of bonds that are paying four and five percent. Okay? Those bonds, we own them. So if you already own those bonds and the market rate of interest goes to zero, those bonds are valuable. People want those bonds because they're paying that interest rate. They continue to pay that coupon every month, every week, every whatever, you know, every uh, semi-annually in, in this case. Um, we have them laddered out so we get so much income each month and it, and it works out very nicely. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a good thing to live on. Um, much like uh, dividends on stocks, you know, people set up so they live off dividends from the stock market. Uh, but bonds, different thing. It's a, it's a loan. So we've had this set. Then we have the market setting the price. The Fed set it at zero. So when you say to me, capitalism failed, I go, well, wait a minute. We don't have capitalism here. We have a Federal Reserve that sets the price of money. That is not laissez-faire. That is not hands off. That is central planning. That's what we do here. We've been doing that since 1913 when the Federal Reserve came into existence. Uh, we can argue about that. There's, there's interesting debate on both sides of, of whether the, the Federal Reserve has been a net good or a net bad. I am on the side of the debate that says it is a net bad. I urge you to look at both sides of that debate and come to your own conclusion. But the market does not set the, the, the price of a bond. The Federal Reserve sets it. So the government sets it. So this this little slide gives you the impression that the market is doing all the work. Well, yes and no. There are fluctuations that, that uh, there, there's the vestiges of an open market, uh, but obviously setting the federal fund rate at zero affects the market very profoundly. Um, and thou shalt not, you know, sell, uh, do, do lend bank to bank for uh, more than zero percent. Um, so, how, what happens? Um, we have a contract rate. If the contract rate, uh, 8% in our first example, is greater than the market rate, zero, then the bond is going to sell at a premium. People are going to want those 8% bonds, just like they're going to want uh, my dad's 5% bonds, right? If the contract rate equals the market rate, the bond's going to sell at par. It's going to sell at 8%. If the contract rate is less than the market rate, the bond's going to sell at a discount. Okay, so if 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 uh, the market rate was eight percent and you had these five percent bonds, nobody really wants them, right? They're, they're not going to they're going to sell at a discount. The discount is going to make up for that three percent between five and eight percent, if you will. Okay, the bond issuer pays the bond interest uh, interest try to set a contract rate coupon rate, right? Um, you can read these notes. They really help. 
uh, my, despite my great lectures. So how do we do amortization? Okay, another uh, $20 word, compute and record amortization of a bond discount using straight line. Oh, my back is sore from sitting in front of screens too much. Um, I, even for me, I, this is too much screen time. Uh, so a discount bond, Phyla, Phyla makes sneakers, right? Um, they issue bond with the following provisions, par value of 100,000, uh, issuing price 96.4% of par value. So it's, it's at a discount. It's selling at a discount. If you went out in the market to buy these 100,000 par value bonds, you would only pay 96.4% of par, excuse me, or $96,400. Stated interest rate is 8%. Market interest rate is 10. You see? So I... I get a break on these because the interest rate's not high enough. Whoops. Uh, it, it, it's selling at a discount. So the bond is selling at a discount because the market interest rate is 10%. Uh, so 630, 1231, uh, December 31st is, is the bond date. The maturity date is uh, 2021, two years. All right. So I'll let you see these. Uh, and that'll give you some background for this. Phyla issues these bonds, ba ba ba. There they go. Um, on the issue date, let's let's pretend. Um, I always talk about the Callaway Cancer Center, right over at Valley View, because I, I was sort of involved in in talking about the financing. I knew the CFO over there when they started to put this thing together. Um, so they issued bonds for that that Callaway Center. Mr. Callaway put up some money. Uh, but but they did issue some bonds, and um, what happened? Well, when you put the deal together, you try and guess or or uh, you get an educated guess of what the interest rate is going to be. So let's say you put the deal together in 2018, and you didn't issue the bonds until 2019. Well, between 20 and 18 and 2019 shit happens uh, and and your bonds go off the, the interest rate has changed so either they're going to go off at a at go off what I mean by go off you issue them and then consumers um, buy the bond and lend you money by buying the bond they're lending you money Th that when that occurs they may go off at a discount or they may go go off at, at a premium uh, depending on what happened to interest rates over the year or so after you began to put the deal together, you began to think about borrowing the money. So here's what happened on the issue date. Um, they should record the bond issue this way, 96400 they got. Here's the discount. Um, this is called a contra liability account. Uh, and, and then the bond payable, of course, is 100000 That's the par value. That, that's on the face of the bond. We owe that money. But we've got this weird, we, we've got this discount that we've got to account for, right? Because we, eventually we've got to pay off that hundred grand. Um, so that's what the, that, this is what the um, uh, entry looks like in, in the general ledger. Uh, so sold by, and here's a little note, we sold the bonds at a discount to their issued date. So what happens? The interest payments... Now we have to amortize that discount. Oh, which means what? We, 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 we've had a little experience with amortization. We're, we're going to amortize that over time, right? So, you know, we, we want to take a little chunk of it each year. And there's methods to do this. Um, you know, if you're a giant corporation and you've got billions of dollars in bonds, uh, how you do this matters. In our case, straight line is fine. You know, I think I think the bond issuance for uh, the Callaway Center was like thirty-two million dollars. It wasn't it wasn't a wasn't a small number, but it wasn't a huge number. Uh, so it it went well. There's my phone. Um, at any rate, the bonds are reported in long-term liabilities sec. Section of issuers December 
31 balance sheet, right? It's a liability on the balance sheet. Does that make sense? If not, go back. Assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity, right? The bond is a loan, so it's a liability, a long-term loan on your balance sheet, right? Um, if if I was issue if I was uh, buying the bonds, they would be an asset to me, right? The other side of that equation. Um, balance sheet is shown at the top portion of the slide. A discount is deducted from the par value of the bonds to yield the carrying or book value. It's almost like we're doing uh, depreciation, right? Uh, same concept. We've got to account for this this discount, so we're we're going to amortize it over a period, uh, which which gives it that resemblance to depreciation over four years. So ninety six four hundred in return, it must pay bondholders a hundred thousand. The thirty six hundred discounts paid to bondholders maturity, and it's part of the cost of using the ninety six four. We we have to account for that the, the entire cost of the bond. It would be unrealistic uh, or fraudulent, if you will, to not account for that crap. Okay. Here's what it looks like: the amortization. Right. Pretty simple. Check the notes, and, and it takes it down to and gets you to that hundred thousand dollar point, and gives you the carrying value each time. The carrying value is also important in case you decide to retire the bonds in midstream. Let's say your company, um, you know, the cancer center this is kind of sick, but if if the cancer center was doing really well, which means there's a lot of people got cancer, but nonetheless. Um, let's just say it's a demographic increase. You know, suddenly people are moving here and, and seeking out cancer treatment at the Callaway Center. Maybe they got the best doctors on the planet. Um, if you don't think there's a market for health care, you've never known anyone with cancer. Uh, they, they go to the Mayo Clinic for a reason. Uh, they, there's a market. It is not. It is it, healthcare is a commodity. It's not a right. Um, you know, we there's an argument to have philosophically, uh, but nonetheless, uh, people go to certain hospitals and go to see certain doctors because they're better at treating certain illnesses. That to me is a market, and and if you if you believe in that, then then you you could say, wow, the the Callaway Center is doing really well. They've got the right doc. One of them lives up by me, actually. Uh, he, they just moved up here. Um, he's a really nice guy. Anyhow, maybe they're coming to see him. Maybe he's got a great reputation. So you're making all this money, and you go, hey, what should we do? Right? We, we've got this windfall profit. We should pay off our debt. That means you may want to retire your bonds early. Well, knowing what the carrying value of the bond is is going to be an integral part of calculating how to pay those bonds off if you wanted to pay them off early right makes sense i hope so um now record amortization of bond premium using straight line um here's adidas adidas um another sneaker like phyla issues bonds with the following provisions uh, maybe they're building another factory. May, who knows what they're doing? They're 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 doing something. Uh, maybe they're I don't know adding Salesforce or something. Par value 100 grand, 103. Oh, okay, we're at premium. So the stated interest rate is 12 percent. We're issuing these bonds at 12 percent, and the market interest rate is 10. These are going to be desirable. People like me who live on coupons are going to go, oh, I want some of those Adidas 12%. Those are great, right? I want those. Uh, so I'm going, to pay, I'm going to pay more than the face, the par value in order to get those bonds because I need the monthly income. You're starting to see the relationship between these, the interest rate and the price. It's a very important relationship. And, and the market sorts it out. Uh, as much as it can when when the Fed is setting interest rates. Um, so we have interest dates of 630, 1231, same old thing. 
Uh, this is a two-year bond again. Um, in, in our notes here, the contract rate of the bond is higher than a market rate. The bond sells at a price higher than par value. Yes. Uh, this is a premium. We're just going to go, I, I don't want to belabor this, um, but it's we're going to do exactly the opposite. Um, this is called an adjunct liability account. Uh, just another word. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's the way it goes. But um, you can see it in your general ledger as this adjunct liability, this premium. You've got this extra money. So what are you going to do with it? Well, you have to account for it. So we, we have this premium on bond payables, 3600 Here's the cash we got. We got a 103600 Hooray. The bonds are reported. Long-term liability section of the balance sheet as shown in the slide. A premium is added on the par value of the yield, the carrying of book value of bonds. Right. This is an adjunct liability again. Uh, so how do we how do we uh, do the interest? Adidas will make the following entry every six months to record the cash interest payment and the amortization of the discount um, premium bonds. So here it is, four four thousand. We've got to discount this thirty six hundred every month to to get rid of it, right? So that we end up with a hundred thousand. So the straight line method allocates an equal portion of total bond interest uh, expense to each of the bond semi-annual interest payments. Um, so we're going to add that 3,600 divided by four is 900 on each one of those. Um, and you can see how that works pretty, you know, pretty simple. Okay. So just the opposite of, of a, uh, you know, discount is a premium. Here's what it looks like here again. Uh, you know, look that over at your stop and start this tape. That's the beauty of not sitting in the classroom, I guess. You get to you get to stop me whenever you want and look carefully at these slides. Uh, so, and this is how it looks on, on a little... Uh, th this is what they'd give you if you were going to be in an exam. And I, I can't remember whether... I'll look at... After I do this, I get through these slides we're about halfway through. Uh, we'll go and we'll go over to the homework and and look at that too. All right, and then we have retirement of the bonds. At the, remember, at the end of the twenty years or two years in this case, um, we've got to retire these bonds. How does that look? The FILA bonds. So we had, we we retire that payable with a debit and credit cash to pay off the bond. I want my money back. The really important thing about bonds compared to stocks, and I think they go over it in, in, a, in a slide here soon, but bondholders get paid. We get paid. Um, if you remember, and the bailouts have begun in this, this latest collapse, uh, and, and again, this collapse is not, was he, we were headed towards collapse anyway. Uh, you know, I get, don't, don't mistake the coronavirus as the, as the pin the bubble was already there. Uh, I thought the pin was going to be the election. It's not. Uh, as we speak, Bernie Sanders just dropped out of the race, and, and so the market is zooming to the upside um, for obvious reasons. I, you know, I'm sorry, but Sanders is uncertainty, uh, and uncertainty is something that markets don't like. Um, and we're in a huge part of the, a big uncertainty right now. That's why the stock market is dropping. If you're curious about what my thoughts on the market are, again, look at my articles on LinkedIn. I, I've sort of laid out where I think price per earnings should take the market. But I also want to mention that I have an overall, I teach accounting, um, but I have great, I, and I don't come from the CPA side of accounting, or, or uh, I, I'm not an accountant by, uh, by trade. Um, I believe that the accounting business is very badly conflicted with corporate money and government money. And I think accounting standards are horrible. I think that's what sunk the New York Stock Exchange. And I had uh, direct dealings with that between my dad and, and my understanding of capital markets. But the 
when I come in and flippantly say Amazon's a Ponzi scheme, I'm, I'm very serious. After this surge of buying, you know, once they once we're done with the toilet paper spree and the coronavirus is over and this recession really sinks in, I think you're going to see the collapse of Amazon. Uh, probably it will be sold off in pieces, but uh, due to their, hopefully, um, the accounting fraud will come out so that maybe investors can learn from it. I think there's a lot of young investors that don't understand how badly distorted the accounting profession has become. Now, it, all we do in business school is talk about ethics and morality and all this other crap. And, and it's not crap, but it's something that you should have learned before you sat down in a seat. Uh, your, your parents or your church or the institutions that you, you believe in should have taught you these, these values so that when it comes time to account for things, you account for them correctly and, and uh, ethically. Uh, I think there's a lot of public companies out there that, that fail at doing that. Um, it's not, again, it's not my disdain of certain people. It's my disdain for institutions that create bad incentives, uh, the government being the biggest one. When you, uh, when you look at the dishonesty at the top in government, it, it trickles down into uh, everyone's lives. We're not used to being honest anymore. And that's, uh, that's all I'll say about that. But um, yes, it's certainly, if you listen to my lectures carefully, you, you understand that as a libertarian, I, I'm not happy with the way things are. Um, I'm also very hopeful, though, that situations like this that we're having right now create good in people. I, th I think that people come out of these things uh, with better ideas of what's going on. Okay, so we retired our bonds. Uh, the discount or premium fully amortized. Uh, carrying value of the bonds are equal to par value at the end. Done. If we retire before maturity, I, I just alluded to this a few slides ago, we've got to uh, figure out what, what else we have a gain or a loss uh, after the retirement price. And these are called callable bonds. Uh, and this happens to us quite a bit. We'll buy callable bonds because, <coughs> uh, and, and excuse me, I have, you know, I'm not sick. I have seasonal allergies combined with what is this? Um, I have sarcoidosis. It's an autoimmune disease and it affects my lungs. So I'm like the guy that can't afford to get this coronavirus. <laughs> and I'm also the guy sitting there going, you got to let it run its course. <laughs> so I'm in a weird place where you know that I'm true to my principles because I'm the guy that's going to die. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm confident I won't. I'm being careful. Uh, so I'm being careful. I don't need the government to tell me to be careful. Uh, anyway, we're back to our bonds, retirement before maturity. A lot of these bonds are callable. That's a feature of a bond. You can, If you read a bond indenture, it's like the owner's manual of the bond, it may have this callability feature, right? That they can, the company has put that feature in so they can call the bond and retire it early and not take a tremendous hit. So they'll set a price. Um, assume the, that 100,000 of callable bonds will be retired July 1st after the first interest payment. The bond carrying value is 104.5. The bonds have a call premium of three grand. See, there's a call premium because investors won't buy the damn thing if they're going to get called back. They need, you need to sweeten the deal with this premium, this $3,000. So that's what they do. They sweeten the deal. Uh, so the people will buy the bonds in the first place, and, and the company may or may not call them in. If depending on how you know how the economy goes, you know there's a whole lot of callable bonds out there that aren't going to get called now because nobody's got any money to call them. Mm. So illustrate the retiring callable bonds. Assume the company issued 100 grand. The call option was three grand. Here's, here's um, how it turns out. There's a 
There's a premium, a gain on bond retirement of fifteen hundred. Right? If if you look at this closely and carefully, uh, um, <laughs> follow Carla. And let, she's going to do it on paper. You know, sit there, sit there with it, so you understand it. Uh, just what occurred, and and it tells it here in black and white. But pretty simple, a pretty simple concept when you think about it. Um, getting the concept behind it, the time value of money is what I really want to get you to understand. You're gonna. Th this is all done electronically now, and but but if you understand the the concepts behind it, you're gonna be way ahead of a lot of people, and you'll be freaked out about <laughs> the government. You'll be freaked out about the amount of bonds that are out there. Uh, financing things like uh, your retirement or, or Social Security or Medicare, Medicaid. Um, yeah. yeah I, and uh, military and all the other bullshit that we do. Uh, holders of convertible bonds are the right. The right. This is the real kind of right. You know, you write a contractual right to convert their bonds to stock. This is interesting, right? You, you can say, well... Uh, if I think the stock, right, I'm, I'm a stodgy old bond buyer because I don't like to take risks. And suddenly I'm in a stock like Converse and I'm going, they just came out with some new sneakers or I don't know, you know, something happened to, to swoosh, 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 Nike and, and Nike's in trouble. And I think Converse stock is going to take off. I might convert my bonds into the stock and, and speculate a little more because stocks are more speculative. Remember uh, what I told you, I wish I had a pen here, but the bond market, you, you know, year in and year out, uh, usually returns about 4.4%. The stock market, it's higher. It's much, it's something like 8.6. Why does the stock market pay more than the bond market? Pay more, pay more in interest. Well, stocks are much riskier. You pay for risk, right? And if if you if you want to read a good book about risk, uh, read Epstein's book. Uh, it's called I'll put it up here. Uh, Against the Gods. Let me see if I can get it up here. Against the Gods. It's a guy by the name of I just loaned it out to. Uh, a friend of mine. Here it is. Oof. Against the gods. Epstein, I think his name is. Is that what? Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, God. Come on. There it is. That's the one. It's a really, really good book. It's so interesting. If you're a business student or, or someone who's just interested in, in uh, risk and how, how Bernstein, I said Epstein, didn't I? Um, brilliant. I mean, just a brilliantly written and it's a, the history of risk and how, you know, insurance came about and things like that. Read it. It'll open your eyes uh, to, to what it is, the difference between the bond market and the stock market. Um, and you should know that if you're, if you're going to be a business student, um, I would suggest it. So convertible bonds are the right to convert bonds to stock. When the conversion occurs, the carrying value is transferred to equity accounts. No gain or loss is recorded, right? Um, because you, you supposedly, you know, you're, you're converting apples to apples. Oh, my God, I got to take this off. My shoulder's killing me. Uh, all right. If I stand up, my pants fall down. It's going to be a problem. To illustrate, assume January first, hundred grand par values converse, hundred thousand converted to fifteen thousand shares, two dollar. Right? Even Steven paid in capital excess of par is seventy thousand. Remember that from from uh, excess paid in value. Now we're going to look at that later on. But did I give you all that? I think so. Yeah. So interesting, convertible, convertible, callable bonds, municipal, uh, corporate bonds, you know, types of bonds and, and uh, uh, attributes of bonds. 
Um, you should know these when you go into your upper division. If you, if you happen to stay in accounting or business, you'll get this pounded into you. Um, if you if you really get interested in the bond market, um, there's plenty of opportunities to get involved in the trading and or pricing of bonds. Um, so it's fascinating. Types of notes. These are different notes. You know, why do we have notes? Well, yeah, you, you're borrowing um, uh, long-term notes from banks and things like that. Like bonds, notes are issued to obtain assets such as cash. Right, uh, assets equal liability plus owner's equity. We're we're trying to get assets in order to expand our business or do something like that. Mm -hmm. Single lender, such as a bank, right? Who else is doing this? Uh, Kelly and I were talking about Airbnb this morning because she is clearly not happy with them uh, because we have a little Airbnb thing, and I don't know, she didn't. She gave people, they gave everybody their money back, you know. We made a reservation. We felt like you should honor the reservation. We have a contract with each one of our uh, people who make reservations, but uh, Airbnb felt that they had to take care of the customers. So, uh, neither here nor there, um, long-term note payable. When repayment of the principal is an interest going to be made? Oh, I know why I mentioned Airbnb. They, they're getting money from venture capital to keep them afloat. Venture capital is just another word for a lender. They're just lending money or, or financing a business. They are venture capitalists, they call them. Um, the term capitalist came from Karl Marx. I, I, I don't know if you know that. I, that's why I don't like it. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't like marks, but I I like uh, I I'd rather call it free markets, um, or you know <laughs> exchange of value. Uh, but nonetheless, we're stuck with capitalism. And uh, n uh, if you're a cap venture capitalist, what you're doing is lending uh, to businesses you think are going to return, it, right? Return. You you want some kind of interest. Right, and, and in the case of a venture capitalist, if you've ever watched Shark Tank, they want a crap load of interest. They want a lot. They want most of your business. Uh, so anyway, we have a note date, a, a maturity date, and and an interest uh, payment. And here's what they look like. It looks like a bond, right? Um, it's the same thing. The only difference between a note and a bond is is that. Um, the regular payments of principal plus interest, right? And uh, at, it's at this point, if, if we were in the classroom and, and I can do this too, um, I want to show you the uh, interest and I, I want to show you an amortization table. And you can find one of these online. I, I'll show you how to do it right now. Um, but let me show you what it looks like on January 1st. Fog Hog borrows 60 grand from a bank to purchase equipment. It signs an 8% installment note requiring three annual payments of principal plus interest. So how do we compute the periodic payment by dividing the... Uh, how do we do this? We compute the periodic payment by dividing the face amount of the note by what's called a present value factor. There's this. This is going to come to you over and over. So I want you to take your time and carefully understand present value. Present value is another illustration of the time value of money or time preference, if you will, in economic terms. And it's is an down here it says an installation note is an obligation requiring a series of payments to the lender. This is your mortgage. Installment notes are common for franchises and other businesses, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they borrow 60000 8%, three annual payments. Uh, the payments on the installment note normally include the accrued interest expense plus a portion of the amount borrowed or principal. The total payment pattern consists of changing amounts of interest and principal, right? 
some assume that Farquhar borrows 60000 by signing a $60,000 note that requires three equal payments of 23282 That's the total. The present value of the annuity of three annual payments of 23282 discounted at 8% equals 60000 The 23282 includes both interest and principal, the amount which changes each payment. All right, so let's look at this. Look at how easy this is. I go, if I go in here and I just say um, amortization table XLS and poof, one will come up. Here's, here's one. I think this is a good one. I can't remember. These are all templates. Uh, let's see if this one comes up. Uh, let me see if this comes up. No, I don't want that. Uh, I don't want an advertisement. I want the table. Uh, Download the spreadsheet. So you look through here and you go, well, there's got to be one that, that has XLS here. God, I always, every semester I've just pulled one up and now, now they're hiding. It's because everybody's selling them. See if I can find it. I'm sorry to screw around with you. Uh, simple loan. Damn it. That's a tutorial. Shoot. Well, I'll find it for you and put it up. I used to have a great one. I know I have one I, I, that uh, it's on my thing. Anyhow. God, that stinks. This is going to show you how it works. There's tables that, that calculate all this crap, and you don't have to do any work at all. It, you can also do it on Excel, you know, in a regular Excel spreadsheet. It'll give you the, the, the net present value you need. So here's, here's how it looks uh, in um, installment notes with equal payments. Right, so uh, if I went to slideshow and make this bigger from this slide, right? Ooh, where did it go? Oh, that's bad. That's bad. Okay, I guess I got to do it this way. Wow, I'm having all kinds of technical difficulties. Anyway. What this shows, and you can look at it. Slide shows a pattern of equal total payments in two parts, interest and principal. Column A shows the notes beginning balance. Column B shows accrued interest for each year at 8% uh, of the beginning note balance. C shows the impact on the notes principal and equals the difference between total payment, column D, and the interest expense in column B. So it's basically showing this table um, as the amount of interest decreases each year, the portion of interest payment applied to principal increases. And again, I'm going to find my little XLS, and, and I'll show you, you know, what happens when you buy a house. It's like if you take out a 30-year mortgage, it takes like almost 12 years before the amount of principal you're paying is more than the interest that you're paying. You're like, holy crap, well, who would do that, you know? Um, but that's what we do. Uh, used, now, remember, I, you know, all, these 30-year mortgages didn't exist when, when I was a kid. Um, no one gave you a mortgage for 30 years. That was, that was something that was uh, engineered by Wall Street in response to, and the banks, in response to government pressure. 
Uh, so, you know, the idea that everybody should own a house, you know, uh, that's neat. You can argue that that's a great idea, that everybody should own a house. I, I would argue that that's not true. They shouldn't. Uh, there's a lot of people. I know personal friends that shouldn't own houses. They don't have uh, the, the acumen or, or they, don't, they just don't know how to manage money well. Uh, and, and some of them have a lot of money. Uh, but nonetheless, they shouldn't own a house. They always ends up looking like dog patch. Uh, so um, you've got to be careful with ins incentives. When you give people incentives to do things, they tend to do them. Um, so first payment. Here's our payment. Interest expense, note payable, and cash. So our total cash was 23282 This is how the payment broke down. Now let's look. Uh, here's, here's the December 31st, 2020. Look at how it changed, right? We had more interest or, or less interest and more principal. Uh, so that that's how that goes. And again, I'll show you later on when I f shut this off and figure out what the, why the hell I couldn't find my Excel sheet. Mortgage, a legal agreement that helps protect the lender if the borrower fails to make the required payment. You're protecting the lender, not the borrower. People that borrow, you, you, you shouldn't be borrowing money if you don't have to. Gives the lender the right to be paid out of the cash proceeds from the sale of the borrower's asset, specifically identified in the mortgage contract. Why do we have so much trouble in 208? Well, the, it was impossible for the banks to get the, you, there were so many different ways to protect, to protect the borrower from the lender because that's the way we skew things in this country, that the, the banks couldn't recover, you know? So, uh, yeah, it was plenty of blame to go around. I, I, I think you ought to watch The Big Short if, if, you, if you want a pretty good explanation of that. I, um, I could <laughs> go into it with you a little bit. Uh, maybe I'll put some stuff up for you to watch uh, about Dr. Michael Burry and a few other people who, who went through 208. Um, my sister was sitting on the mortgage desk at Deutsche Bank when, when all this went down. And, and when you asked her what happened, she said, people didn't pay their bills. They should be put in jail. And you're like, wow, that's pretty heavy. You know, what about fractional reserve banking? Isn't that a problem? Um, you know, she and I disagree on a few things. But uh, there's plenty of blame to go around. I think most of it belongs in Washington. Uh, Washington thinks most of it belongs on Wall Street. Um, there's some truth to both of those arguments. Mortgage legal agreement. Mortgage notes pledge time. Uh, specific assets as security for the note. Mortgage backed, we call it. Mortgage backed securities. That means somewhere in the mix there's a house, right? Um, if you're lucky enough, like I am, to have paid cash for your house, I own my house. Most people don't own their house. The bank owns their house. Uh, they're paying a mortgage. They have a loan out on it. Okay, assess debt features and their implications. This is the important part. Uh, bonds and notes have these features, right? They can be secured or unsecured. Convertible, callable, term and serial, serial registered and bearer. These, this is all your vocab. Uh, specific assets of the issuer pledge, mortgage as collateral. The issuer fails to pay interest on par value or secured holders can demand collateral. Um, then we have term or serial bonds. Uh, serial bonds are what I buy, I, you know, series dates so that so that I can get income month after month after month. You know, it, it's, it's easier for me. Um, registered or bearer, bearer bonds, I, if there was an old movie uh, oh God, what was it called with, uh, I, it'll come to me. Um, <laughs> but it was about a theft of bearer bonds. You know, whoever holds the bonds is the bearer of those bonds and, and they can get, you know, you find some bearer bonds in grandma's old trunk. Well, the coupons are still good on those bonds. And the coupons is an old word, is an old kind of a term. But back in the day, when you bought war bonds or, you know, during World War II or something, you clipped the coupons, they said. Or you, the coupons were on the bond itself, or they gave you a book with coupons in it. And you went to the bank with the coupon, and they gave you money. 
they were they they these coupons were you know you used to say well what am I going to do to retire I'm going to clip coupons well they were talking about clipping coupon not the kind of coupons you know ten cents off on milk uh, clipping coupons from bonds in order to get income so uh, those are types features and types of bonds we have general obligation bonds too at, at, in, in the municipal bond business general obligation bonds are taxpayer funded um, and and then we have uh, uh, also have secured and unsecured bonds in that area debt to equity all right now we, we in each chapter we've got some kind of a measure of, of what the hell's going on um, when you think about a business you want to see how much debt do they have and how much equity right debt, debt to equity is is a measure of right total liabilities to total equity right how much do you have in bonds how much do you have in stock it could be right um, equity is is helps investors determine the risk of investing in a company by dividing its total liabilities to total equity um, Company finance mainly with debt is more risky because liabilities must be repaid. This is what they didn't get in 2008. What every president that I've ever known has has done an impeachable offense. Um, in the case of Barack Obama, he should be in prison because when General Motors went out of business, he went over. He, he did not pay the debt the bondholders and instead paid the United Auto Workers. If someone had sued, they could have sued him and they'd have won because you had to pay the, the bondholders first. Uh, in that particular case, the bondholders were afraid of the government. So they took they took the worst deal that they could, you know, they get screwed. Um, GM should have gone out of business, in which case everything would have been sold, maybe to Tesla. And then the bondholders would have been made whole. In other words, they would have got 100 cents on the dollar. Debt to equity for Nike and Under Armour. You can see uh, debt to equity is 0.98. Their total liability is 10 billion, I'm sure that is, to 12 billion in equity. Uh, so not too bad. Um, Under Armour, these two are better. Oh, it's getting better, I see. 0.8775, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can understand how that works. All right. Um, to compute the price of a bond, we apply present value concepts. Uh, a bond's market value at issuance equals the present value of future cash payments, or the interest or the discount rate of the bond's market rate. This is th this this here is the basis of that silly question. The best way to get your head around net present value, if you will, is you win the lottery. Should you take the cash or the annuity? Well, it, take it, everybody takes the cash because they don't trust the government. Maybe I, you know, um, but in general, people don't take the annuity because of that. But let's assume that the annuity is going to be paid. Paid. It's going to be paid. Um, there's no such thing as a default. Uh, so if we all things being equal, what we would do is say, well, what's the cash payment and what's the annuity? We would figure out the net present value of the future cash payments and see if they were higher than the um, cash out value. What determines this? The interest rate. So if you take the cash, you're betting that there's going to be a higher interest rate in the future. That's what you're betting on, okay? Okay. Present value of a discounted bond. This is how, when, the, when a bond is selling at a discount, you're trying to figure out the present value. So the issue price of bonds is found by computing the present value of the bond's cash payments. Discounted at that rate, right? So when computing the present value of phyla bonds, we work with semi-annual compounding periods because this is the time between interest payments. The annual market rate of 10% is considered a semi-annual rate of five. Also, um, you know, and, and you can find the present value of these things. So here's the calculation. 
This is how it works. Uh, we need re relevant interest rate and, and a number of periods to do this. The math is right here. Uh, it's pretty simple. Anybody can do it. Uh, if you can understand, do these problems, and I put I put several of these problems in the in the homework, which I'll go over next. Um, but nonetheless, if you can do these problems, you are way ahead of of your peers. To, if you can understand this present value factor and how it works in the equation, you'll you, you're gonna you're gonna really understand something. Um, and here it is at a premium. This is this is a discount. And this is a premium. Go over these slowly and, and learn them. And lastly, we've got compute and record amortization of a bond discount using a, the effective interest rate method. As I said in, in, earlier on, most, most uh, bonds are discounted at a, at a uh, straight in a straight line method. Um, you can use this effective interest rate method. It's a little more accurate. If you're issuing billions of dollars worth of bonds, it's the better way to do it. Um, and the same thing with a premium. It goes like this. Uh, now, there's one other thing I wanted to cover and make sure you understand. Um, Accounting for leases and pensions. Going forward, you're gonna. This is gonna come up a lot. Um, leases and pensions are are uh, troublesome areas of public finance, and uh, leases. Accounting for leases, I, I in my vernacular is what's gonna take Amazon out. They've been dishonest about what is what is a lease. A lease is an agreement between a lessor or an owner and the lessee, which is the renter or tenant gives the lessee the right to use an asset for a period of time, da, da, da. Well, when you look at uh, what, what uh, Amazon does is they buy things and, and create shell companies and lease them back to themselves, thereby they're, they're taking capital items that should be liabilities and turning them into expenses. And that's fraud as far as I'm concerned. Um, nonetheless, this is what you do here. Operating leases are long-term leases that do not meet any of the five criteria for finance leases. This is where I, where I run into when the problems within the accounting field. There's no question. Companies know what a lease is, and they know what a, a an operating lease is and a capital lease, uh, and they know what owning something is and borrowing something is. Uh, they're being dishonest is, is what's going on. And, and it's, it, it, we're teaching you this in, in a way that aids and abets a fraud as far as I'm concerned. And this is one of the problems with price per earnings and, and what's going on in the stock market is the fraud comes to an end after a certain amount. Finance lease are long-term leases. Lessee receives substantially all remaining benefits of the opposite asset. Well, you own it then it's not a lease. You own it. That's what uh, people like me are saying. Uh, some accountants disagree, but I think they're wrong. So that's that. Um, make sure operating leases are long-term leases that don't meet any of these five criteria of finance leases. I took an entire course on making adjustments for leases. It was the most absurd thing I ever did. Uh, it was part of my master's degree in accounting, and I thought, this is really ridiculous. Um, people who invest in companies like Amazon, uh, the ones who are looking hard, they know that these leases are bullshit and that they actually own things. Pensions, same thing, defined benefit plans. It's an agreement for, by, for an employer to provide benefits to an employees after they retire. I mean, you've heard about these in the public sector. Uh, running into real problems. The problems that they usually run into is that politicians get involved in pensions and they make rosy sort of projections on what pension plans can make, how much they can make in interest in the future. And that's why they collapse. They also give away, um, they're buying votes so what they do is they offer pensions to 
firemen and policemen and teachers and all sorts of people that uh, they can't afford, um, but they rely on the taxpayer to be able to afford them. Uh, these these things collapse and and uh, and are collapsing all around the country. Um, we're about to see another round of that go on. Uh, so. Um, an agreement by employer to provide benefits used to be uh, you, um, we called Social Security a pension. It's not a pension; it's a tax. Um, it, it, to be really real about it, many pensions are known as defined be defined benefit plans, the defined future payments. Employers' contributions vary. Um, a lot of times, you're putting in money, and and they're matching you, or things like that. Um, but uh, understanding. These is, is very important. Okay, I hope I didn't go too fast, but of course you can scroll back and look through uh, the notes and stuff like that. You can also get these PowerPoints um, off of McGraw-Hill and look at them yourself. So that's all I've got in this tape. I'll bring up an amortization schedule and I'll go through the homework in the next one. So thanks for watching. I hope you're all well. <laughs> Talk to you later.